So why does it cost so much? Well, here are a couple of reasons. Um, many of the big deposits of oil and gas have been found. In fact, most, we think, have already been found. So we talk about the sedimentary basins that contain them as mature. They're highly explored. There are lots of wells. In the Gulf of Mexico, there are something like 40,000 oil and gas wells. So we would consider that highly prospected already. But there are discoveries in the Gulf of Mexico being announced almost every month. So it's a very prolific oil and gas system, and it has not been fully evaluated, even though it's got 40,000 wells in it. Expensive places to operate. My sister tells people I go to more places nobody else wants to visit. <laughs> okay, there's one. Uh, this is the North Slope of Alaska. When I mentioned that we try to leave a zero footprint after we drill a well, here's what we do in Alaska. We build our roads in the winter. This is an ice road. When summer comes, that will melt, and there's no evidence that we were ever there. <laughs> we go out on the tundra. It's frozen solid. In the summer, the tundra is very soft and soupy, and you can sink in up to your waist if you try and walk across it. And you can do a lot of environmental damage if you're up there in the summer. So the exploration window is from December to April. We try and get it all done on the ice roads. Uh, the former Soviet Union has a lot of Arctic regions as well, so it's considered an expensive place to operate. The Middle East has a lot of wells drilled in it, but a lot of opportunities left. And if any of you are from that part of the world, you know it's expensive. <coughs> it's expensive for Westerners to come in and stay in a hotel room that costs eight hundred. And a lot of our opportunities are offshore and in places like the North Sea where the waves can be 100 feet high. Another thing a lot of people don't realize, you hear politicians say, oh, we've got to open up the continental shelf to drilling. And that will solve our energy problems. Well, the problem is, once you find a discovery, it can take here 7 to 10, but I'd stretch that, 8 to 12 years before you get any money back. And I was asked the other night here in Boston by somebody who's got investment opportunities in oil and gas. And I said, well, if you've got people who are willing to invest the money and they are willing to wait 12 years for their return, it's a good business to be in. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people are not in that category. Yes. And what is it, uh, what takes so long? Is it really the, the entire prospecting cost or is it the uh, legal requirements? And yes and yes. Um, usually you try to get the legal requirements out of the way up front so you know you have the right to produce it. <coughs> but the business of deciding how big it is can take several more wells. And then designing and building the surface facilities can take several years. And then getting the pipeline to wherever it needs to go. And all of these things are usually done sequentially because you don't want to make that big investment up front before you know the answer. So you have to wait three or four years to decide how big it is and then you can start cutting the pipe. And often these investments are huge, several billion dollars, and you don't want to commit that without some confidence that you've got the volume forecast right and that the price of oil is going to be allowing you to do it. And right now, the price of oil is down to $60 a barrel thereabouts, and a lot of projects that are underway are going to be non-economic if it stays there. So we are betting that it's going to climb back up. Is that in, I mean, the, the Hubbard Peak theorem, which is basically as an oil field reaches about 50 percent of its reserve, it becomes uneconomical. Um, yeah. Not overseen. When you talk about the economic limit, mm -hmm. does that sort of imply that as oil becomes <coughs> more profitable, or say six, seven hundred dollars a barrel, then all of a sudden it becomes worthwhile to extract? Because it seems like exactly. there's a lot of it's left behind. Yeah. There are two things to what you just asked, and they're both true. Uh, one is the global supply, and that's what he mentioned. The Hubbard theory is that you reach a point at which it noses over and there is no more to be found. That keeps moving as the price goes up. It keeps moving out into the future. And eventually you're going to reach a point where it's not worth putting in your car. It's too expensive. And some people believe they've reached that. And we had a big move toward public transport and then suddenly it's going to quiet again. Uh, so that, that's true also. But the, the other one that you mentioned about the economic limit on an individual field that also varies by price, but it also varies by technology. And if you realize that in a typical field, we're going to leave about half of the oil in the ground. If you can do anything to get more of that out, whether it's injecting seawater, injecting steam, injecting detergent, injecting microbes, there are all kinds of things you can do to get that last little bit of oil out. Uh, probably the best we're ever going to do is with natural gas, where we can get 
but anywhere between 50 and 90 percent, there's a range of opportunity for technology that will get it out of the ground. And if, you, if you've capped your well, and you go on to someplace else, and you mentioned some of your engineers are looking at things you did 20 or 30 years ago, do you still own that well, or can anybody? Uh, that depends. If you declare it abandoned, you do not. If you declare it temporarily abandoned, in various parts of the world, that has different meanings, but you may be able to go back. The risk is always that the local government will say, well, if you can't do it, we'll give it to somebody who can. Yeah. And that's that's a threat that's over us in many parts of the world when we say we're abandoning this. And I, I spent some time in front of the Norwegian authorities saying, we're shutting down two platforms. We're not abandoning the resource on the ground. And that was an argument that seems to have worked. Was there another question? So, yeah. Just curious, have you found that your ice road season is shrinking? Mm -hmm. What impact does that have on your exploration? And exploration? It has shrunk about two weeks in the time that I've been aware of it, which is the last eight years. And it does have a real limiting, it is a real limit on whether you can drill and test and produce in a single season. So often we have to drill and temporarily abandon and come back the next season and do more. Doesn't everybody in the field, in a way, or there are some companies that are taking different routes at all, or everyone basically understands what the problem is similar and um, attacking that similar. Each company tries to distinguish itself, usually, at least our company, we try to dis distinguish ourselves technologically so that we will be the preferred partner from some new country we're going to. But we're all using the same methodologies, pretty much. And then this last one uh, I mentioned, the stranded natural gas, the technology that changed there was the ability to liquefy it and put it in a tanker. And suddenly parts of the world with natural gas are opened up for development.